Okay. Um, first question on the structured mock. Um, so it starts off with a simple um, recall of definitions. Okay. So the first one, displacement. There's two ideas you need to get across here. And um, weirdly, the mark scheme on this question was different to mark schemes I've seen in the past. Okay. So um, I've said before, and it's on the on the um, definitions booklet I made. Um, that there's two things with vector. The first thing is that it has direction or is a vector. You need to get that idea across, and that's what most people forgot to say. And the second idea is that it's the straight line distance between the start and the finish, or between two points. The second one is acceleration. This is, again, a really simple definition, same as the equation, which is rate of change in velocity, or change in velocity divided by time. Okay. Moving on to the second part. So you can see this is a kinematics question part B here. So we've had the definitions, now we need to do some calculations. So we've got a car being launched at an angle. It's like a projectile being launched at an angle. And then we can see it's hitting a ramp. So it's a bit weird because it's not hitting the flat ground, it's hitting a ramp. So it's launched with a velocity of 5.5 meter per second at an angle theta. Um, the horizontal component of the velocity is 4.6. So we can see here there is also, we know this is 4.6 meters per second. Okay, so scrolling down. Show that the car leaves the ramp with a vertical component of velocity of 3 meters per second. One mark, so it must be quite straightforward. And what they're looking at here is, can we break down a vector into its horizontal and vertical components. Okay, so that's what we're going to do now. We've been given, okay, this component here as being 5.5, okay? We've been given, not a component, sorry, we've been given the velocity. We've been told this angle is theta, okay? And we also know the horizontal component is 4.6, okay? That means the vertical component, if I add the horizontal and the vertical component, I'm going to call it Vy together, it must make my resultant velocity. Okay, so actually I can just use Pythagoras to answer this question. And you can see here that 5.5 squared equals okay, 4.6 squared plus Vy squared. And then you're just going to rearrange that. Okay, to get Vy equals 3.0 meters per second. Okay, the other way you could have done this was by calculating theta and then using that to find Vy. However, that method was a bit longer. Okay, so you determine the time taken for the car to travel between the ramps. Okay, so here it's a little bit trickier. It's two marks this time. Looking at the horizontal velocity, I'm thinking, okay, the easiest way to find time taken is I've got a distance, I've got the horizontal velocity. Ah, but I don't know the horizontal distance there, it's just d. So I can't use the horizontal um, velocity. However, I do know the vertical distance. It stays and it lands back at the same height it left at, okay? So I'm going to do a little SUVAT vertically here. S-U-V-A-T. Okay. So I know displacement, just looking here vertically, displacement vertically is zero. It just goes, ends up at the same height it started at. It does have an initial speed vertically, which is positive, okay, 3.0. It's going upwards. It will have a final speed. I'm going to just leave that for now. We don't know what it is. We technically do know what it is, but I'm not going to bother going into that now. And I do know the acceleration. So if it's moving upwards originally, the acceleration is in the opposite direction. So it'll be minus 9.81. And we're trying to find t. Uh, I've only got one unknown here, so I can use SUVAT to solve this vertically. Okay. So I can see if you haven't got v, one of the most common um, SUVAT equations we ever use is S equals UT plus a half AT squared. And now I can substitute into here and I can go 0 equals 3T 
plus 9.81 over 2 t squared. Okay, you're then going to factorize that, okay, and you're going to get uh, a value for t after factorization of um, 0 0.61 seconds, okay, to two significant figures. And we're going to pop that in there. I did mention earlier that we do know v, and the reason for that is, is that, that if it leaves with an original speed here of 3 meters per second upwards, I know, assuming no energy has been lost, it must have the same amount of energy when it gets back to the same point, which means it must be traveling at the same speed it left at. So actually, we do know v here will be minus 3.0 meters per second. So we could have actually used an alternative SUVAC method here. But if you didn't want to go into the, um, didn't necessarily know that was true, you could have used the normal SUVAC as per usual. Okay, now they ask us to find D. So this is horizontally, we want to find D. And you know horizontally, there's no acceleration, so we're just going to use speed, distance, and time. We know the horizontal speed from earlier is 4.6. Okay. We're trying to find D, and we found the time just then of 0 0.61. Okay, so I'm just going to do um, distance equals speed times time. Okay, um, 4.6 times 0 0.61 equals um, 2.8 meters. Let's say, for example, you didn't know how to find the time taken before and you were stuck, okay? What you should do in this case is you should just make up a time, okay? Just come up with a random time. Just say 0 0.5 or one second, okay? It doesn't matter. Just put something in there, okay? The reason you're going to do that is is because then you can use that made-up time to answer this question and you can get an error carried forward mark okay if you put nothing in for that time taken then you can't answer the next part of the question and you can't pick up any marks so if you can't do a question and then you're going to use that number later on in the question just make up an answer okay that's really important so on to the next part of this okay so this is the kinetic energy of the car at its maximum height, divided by the kinetic energy of the car as it leaves ramp P. Okay, so we've got to think about this car's journey. Okay, and at the start, we know its velocity at the start. Its velocity at the start from before was 5.5 meters per second. Okay, so I know the kinetic energy at the start. Okay, uh, the kinetic energy at the maximum height here. Okay, what is the velocity at the maximum height? Well, at the maximum height, we know that the vertical velocity is zero at this point. Okay, that's why it's reached the maximum height, because it's not moving upwards anymore. Okay, however, at that height, I know the horizontal velocity will be unchanged. The horizontal velocity will be that 4.6 meters per second because there's no acceleration horizontally. So if I know the velocity of the object at the maximum height, and I know the velocity of the object at its starting position, now I can use um, those to answer this. So there's gonna be one mark for just writing kinetic energy equals a half mv squared. So if you couldn't have done this, just recalling that equation would have helped you. Okay. The next part, my ratio will therefore be, and the energy of the maximum height will be a half, okay, times the mass times 4.6 squared, divided by a half times the mass times 5.5 squared. This will just cancel, okay, because it's on the same on both sides of the fractions, and then I just need to solve this, okay, so the ratio equals this, and if you do put that in, 4.6 squared over 5.5 squared, 
um, that should give you 0 0.70. Okay, just leave that to two significant figures and pop it in there. Okay, then finally, part C. Okay, the ramp Q is removed. This is important here. Okay, the ramp Q is uh, removed. It now lands directly on the ground. Okay, so the car leaves the ramp at P at times T and lands on the ground at time T. Okay, so it's going to land here and we're going to sketch the variation of the vertical component VY from T0 to T equals T. So, it doesn't really matter here. We, it says numerical values of T, uh, of VY is not required. So I'm just going to put in, and I'm going to say, well, this is its velocity at the start. We said it was 5.5, so I'm going to pretend it's there. Okay, oh, it wasn't 5.5, sorry, it was 3.0 vertically. Okay, so 3.0 vertically at the start. We know that as the acceleration is downwards, that vertical velocity is going to decrease. The acceleration is constant vertically throughout the journey. It's always minus 9.81. So it's going to have a constant negative gradient. Okay. However, there is an important thing here. It is going, when it hits the ground, it is going to have fallen a larger distance than it journeyed on the way up. If I sketch it for you here, okay, we had the ramp, we had the gap, and now it's finishing on the ground. Okay, so it started here, it's going to go up, it's going to go up, and it's going to end up at a lower height than where it started. Okay, so that's important because if it ends up at a lower height, that means it's going to end up at a, um, a greater speed it's going to hit the ground with than the ground it left with. Okay, so that's important. I need to make sure that the final speed is lower than the speed it started at. So, okay, always greater. This might be a made up number that's bigger than th negative three. Okay, now I know the acceleration is constant. Now I can draw in that straight line between the two. So the second mark, the key bit about the second mark was this needed to be a bigger than the final speed needed to be bigger than the initial speed. Okay, there shouldn't be any curving on this. It should be a straight line. We know acceleration is constant vertically, so this should be a straight line. We know acceleration is always downwards, so it should always be a negative gradient. Okay, great. That's the end of question one. Okay, question number two. So part A is naming base units. And the key thing we need to pay attention here is it says units not quantities, okay? So the quantities are the things we're measuring, like distance or length, um, mass or time. The units, okay, are what they are measured in, like kilograms, meters, and seconds. They actually gave you examples here. They made it nice and easy. So the other four ones they haven't mentioned are the ampere, the mole, the kelvin, and the candela, okay? The ones they were really looking for were the ampere, and the Kelvin. We sometimes shorten ampere to amps, but the actual unit is ampere. Okay, moving this along. Part B. We've got a uniform beam, okay, which is placed on a uh, horizontal surface, then tilted at an angle, and then there's obviously something over here. Um, we can see a force here holding it in position, and it's kind of held above the ground. Okay, we've got a horizontal force X here along the ground, okay. What is that force going to be? Well, if it's sliding along the ground, obviously that force is going to be um, friction. Okay. Then they're nice to us. They tell us to take moments about end B. Okay. So we're going to take moments about here. Okay. Calculate the weight of the beam. So we know it's held in equilibrium, which means our moments must be equal. Okay. Moment equals force times perpendicular distance to the pivot. X and Y have no distance to the pivot, so we can ignore them. We only have to worry about W and A. Okay, so the next thing is we've got to do perpendicular distance to the pivot. So 
So perpendicular means between the line of action of the force and the pivot, it needs to be a right angle. So for force A, we can see those, that distance and that force are at a right angle. So for force A, okay, for moment for A, that's nice and straightforward. It's just going to be 90 times 6.0. For force W, it's a little bit harder. So the weight will be acting from the centre of gravity, which we know this distance here will be 3.0 metres for the weight. But that distance there and that force are not perpendicular. They're at an angle. Okay? So we cannot use them like that. So we've either got to work out this distance here, which is at a right angle to my force, or I've got to make the force a right angle to that three meter distance by working out the component of it in that direction. Okay. In this question, I think it's easier to just work out this distance I'm going to call D here, which is the distance between point B and W at a right angle. Okay. So I'm just going to redraw that triangle here. So we've got here is W, I've got here is 3 metres, and I've got this angle is 31 degrees. Okay, I want this distance, because the distance that's at a right angle between W and point B over here. So I can see D here equals, okay, 3.0 cos 31, okay, using trigonometry there. Okay, so um, I'm then going to put this into my equation. Okay, and I'm going to say my moments are equal in each direction. My moment for A was um, 90 times 6. And I know that must be equal to the moment from uh, W. Okay, so that will be uh, W times D. And D is equal to 3.0 times cos 31. Okay, I'm then going to substitute that in and rearrange for W, and you should get W equals uh, 210 newtons to two significant figures. Okay, now we're going to find the magnitude of force X. It's only one mark, so it should be straightforward. Let's have a look at X. Well, X is a horizontal force, okay, over here. And um, I could, to solve it, I could take moments um, somewhere else, but I don't know why, so that would make life tricky. What I can think about, though, is resolving forces horizontally. And I know that horizontally, my forces must cancel out, okay? And I can see there's only two forces that have a horizontal component, X and A, okay? So let's have a look at working out the horizontal component of A, the horizontal component of A here. That must be equal to X for this to not be sliding one way or the other, accelerating one way or the other. So I know X equals the horizontal component of A. So the horizontal component of A, well, A is 90 degrees, but I don't necessarily know that angle. So I've got to have a look at how I can find this angle for A, theta here. Sorry, it's a little bit messy. Okay. Um, how are we going to find that angle? Well, we know that the, um, the uh, beam is at an angle of 31 degrees to the horizontal. Okay, so I'm going to do like a little Z angles here. I know this is 31 degrees which means Z angles wise, I know this is 31 degrees, okay? A is at 90 degrees to the beam, so this angle here must be 90 minus 31 degrees, okay? So now I can do this, so I know X, the horizontal component of X, horizontal component of A, sorry, Okay, if that is 90 minus 31, so 90 minus 31 is 59 degrees. 
the horizontal component of a, okay, ax equals a cos 59, okay, or if you've done a different method, you've done your triangles differently, you would have got a sine 31, okay, these are the same, okay, sine of 31 and cos of 59 give the same answer, okay, we know a is 90, so x is going to be 90 times cos 31, okay, sorry, 9 times cos 59, my bad, okay, 90 times cos 59 is 46 newtons, and that is number 2 completed. Okay, here we have question three. Part A, sound waves are longitudinal waves. By reference to the direction of propagation of energy, state what is meant by a longitudinal wave. Now, I've already written the answer out here, but I just want to point out a couple of key words. First, longitudinal. We've got to make sure that we've uh, picked up on the fact it's longitudinal, not transverse. But this is the important bit here. By reference to the direction of propagation of energy, state what's meant by a longitudinal wave. So it's vibrations of particles are parallel to the direction of, and because they want reference to the propagation of energy, you have to say propagation of energy. Without the propagation of energy, you will not pick up the mark. Part B, a stationary sound wave in air has amplitude A. In experiment, a detector is used to determine A squared. The variation of A squared with distance along X along the wave is shown in figure 4.1. Now this caught a lot of people out. We do not have a waveform with amplitude. We have amplitude squared, which does a couple of things. First of all, it makes every value positive. Second of all, you've got to be very careful because the, sec the first part of this question is state the phase difference between the vibrations of an air particle at 25 and 50 centimeters. Now I've drawn a couple of dotted lines to show the two points and you can see with A squared they are peak to peak which automatically might make you think that the phase difference is 360 degrees or 0 degrees and in fact that was the most common answer but it's not correct. Because we have an amplitude of A squared and not A, we, we really want to do is imagine what this wave looks like if it had an amplitude of just A and that's what we need to calculate the phase difference. So if this had an amplitude of A, it would actually start off at 2, then it would go down to 0, then it would go down to minus 2, up to 0, and there to 2. Now you can see here, with these two points, they are in fact not 360 degrees or 0 degrees out of phase. They are in fact 180 degrees. So the answer for that one is 180 degrees. The second part of the this question says the speed of the sound in air is 330 meters per second determine the frequency of the sound wave so you get a mark by writing down the first equation the wave equation here v equals f lambda that gives you uh, the first mark the second thing that we need to do is find out the wavelength then well if this 25 centimeter difference between these two points is half a wavelength or 180 degrees phase difference our wavelength is not 25 centimeters, it's 50 centimeters, or 0.5 meters. We must have it in terms of meters because we've been given our speed of sound in meters per second. So to work out the frequency, rearrange it, velocity over wavelength, 330 over 0.5 gives us a frequency of 660 hertz. So that is our answer for part B I I. Finally then determine the ratio of the amplitude of wave uh, x equals 20 centimeters and the amplitude of wave uh, x equals 25 centimeters. Well let's have a look at what the amplitudes are already. Now if I do another dotted line here uh, at 20 centimeters and read off this point it looks to me like it's 2.6 so at x equals 20 centimeters, a squared is 2.6. At 25 centimeters, I've already drawn the dotted line there, you can see the amplitude is 4 centimeters. So when x is 25 centimeters, a squared 
is two point uh, is four centimeters. So in order to work out the amplitude of A over the amplitude of uh, at x equals 20 centimeters compared to the amplitude of A over wave at x equals 25 centimeters, what I need to do then is take the ratio of A squared and square root it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the 2.6 over 4.0 and I'm going to square root the whole lot. Type that into my calculator and you can see here we've got 2 sig fig, 2 sig fig, 2 sig fig. I'm going to write it to 2 sig fig. And that is the final mark. Okay, here we have question 4. Uh, part of the particle physics, nuclear physics topic. Uh, part A, in the following list, underline all particles that are leptons. So the only, there's two leptons here, and I know it's only worth one mark, um, but a proton we know is not a lepton. A quark uh, is not a lepton. A lepton means it's not made up of quarks. So the only two that we have here are an antineutrino and a posit uh, positron and that will get you one mark. For part B, a stationary nucleus of magnesium 27 decays by emitting a beta minus particle and gamma radiation. An incomplete equation to represent this decay is this. So magnesium 27 goes to X, some kind of nucleus, a beta minus particle and some kind of gamma radiation. Now the important thing to note here is it's an incomplete equation. We're gonna uh, come back to that in a second. Uh, but state the nucleon number and the proton number of nucleus X. Well, beta minus decay uh, means that the nucleon number doesn't change, so that's got to stay at 27. But of course, during beta minus decay, a down quark is changed to an up quark, and that's what uh, releases the beta minus particle, but essentially a neutron is uh, converted into a, uh, a proton. So we have one more proton than we normally do, so that's 13 protons instead of 12, and that will get you one mark for each of those. Beta minus decay is a product of the weak nuclear force or weak interaction. You can either put for force or interaction for the mark. Um, so without the weak nuclear force, this wouldn't occur. The final one, and again, this is probably the, the one that was answered the least uh, accurately. State two possible reasons why the sum of kinetic energy of the beta minus particle and the energy of the gamma radiation is less than the total energy released during the decay of the magnesium nucleus. Now, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of concepts, uh, tricky concepts going on with this, and it is probably the hardest part of this question. A lot of people really remembered um, the concept about the fact that the mass energy must be conserved between the interactions um, but a lot of people didn't go back to this in this uh, fact here you have an incomplete equation so this is not everything that is being released so t two possible reasons why the sum of kinetic energy of the beta particle and the energy of the gamma radiation is less than the total energy released during the decay well, there's one extra particle not being put down here for start that is released, and that is the electron antineutrino. So, first thing we need to state is an electron antineutrino is produced, and that will take uh, some of the energy needed for. Well, some of the energy released during this decay. So an electron antineutrino is produced. That's where uh, some of the extra energy is going to be made up for the total energy released during the decay. And the last thing is that the, the magnesium is stationary. The, the subsequent particles that are released will all have kinetic energy. Um, and they've only talked about the sum of kinetic energy of the beta minus, uh, minus particle and the gamma radiation we need to include the fact that this mysterious extra nucleus X will also have kinetic energy. And once we've written that, then we've basically stated that all the energy released from this, uh, all the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy released during this decay will be the kinetic energy of this particle, the kinetic energy of the beta minus, the gamma radiation, and the electron antineutrino. All of those four particles with their kinetic energy will sum to make the total energy released during the decay of the magnesium nucleus.
Okay, now we're on to question five. Part A, mass, length, and time are all SI base quantities. State two other SI base quantities. So I think uh, the main bit to underline here is quantities. We're not talking about units here, we need quantities. Uh, and there's a couple of answers you could have made. Um, current is one SI base quantity. Temperature is another. We could have also had um, luminous intensity. So any uh, one of those will get one mark, two marks overall. Part B, a wire hangs between two fixed points as shown in figure 1.1. So we've got a tire hooked up to a rope hooked onto this wire. The tension in each side of these wires is 150 newtons with the angle uh, being 17 degrees to the horizontal. So child's swing is made by connecting a car tire to the wire using a rope and a hook. Assume that the rope and hook have negligible weight. We are asked to determine the weight of the tire. So that is the amount of force required to keep this tire stationary and not let it fall to the ground or move it upwards. So essentially we need to know what force is the wire producing vertically upwards. So I'm going to draw a little triangle here on my diagram. And I'm going to draw the same triangle down, down here. Uh, we've got this, which is 17 degrees. We've got the 150 newtons. So if I want this force here, I've got the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle. I've got the angle, and I want to work out the opposite. So in order to work out this force, I'm going to do 150 sine 17. But I don't just have one of these. There's the weight uh, from both tensions on the wire. So I'm going to have to actually multiply this by 2 to get the total weight of my tire. When I type that into my calculator, uh, let's have a look. We've got two significant figures. The angle is to two significant figures. I'm going to write the weight to two significant figures, which is 88 newtons. The next part then, uh, the wire has cross-sectional area 7.5 millimeters squared uh, and is made of a metal of Young's modulus 2.1 times 10 to the 11. The wire obeys Hooke's law. Calculate for the wire the stress. So for the first mark we get, uh, for writing down the equation, stress equals force divided by area. Let's have a look at the force. Now, it's uh, we just need to look at one of these wires. So if we go back up to here, the force on this wire, let's just take a look at one of them, because we can assume that they can basically separate out. We can deal with them separately. One wire has a force on it of 150 newtons. So we have 150 newtons divided by the cross-sectional area. Now, this, we've got to be very careful, it's in millimeters squared, and pascals, uh, the, if, we, if we turn it into SI units, would be newtons per meter squared, not millimeters squared. So we need to turn millimeters squared into meters squared. So uh, one meter is one times 10 to the minus three millimeters that means one meter squared is one times 10 to the minus six millimeters squared if I square both sides so I don't want to just divide by 7.5 I need to divide by 7.5 times 10 to the minus six typing that in a calculator again two sig fig seems to be the one I'm going to so two sig fig is 2.0 times 10 to the seven pascals Finally then, uh, we've got the final question, the strain. Calculate the strain. Well, Young's modulus we've been given is stress over strain. Uh, so if I rearrange that, strain must be stress over Young's modulus. I've just calculated the stress. I've been given, uh, further back in the question, the Young's modulus. Uh, which is up here. So, 
final bit of calculation, type in my stress that I worked out earlier, 2.0 times 10 to the 7 divided by 2.1 times 10 to the 11. Type it in my calculator, 2 sig fig again, it's 9.5 times 10 to the minus 5. There is no units because it's strain and it's just the ratio of the extension to the original length. So no units to worry about there. Okay, uh, question number six on the structured paper. Make estimates. Okay, so I think most people got speed of sound correct, nice and straightforward. Should know from GCSE, from general knowledge, speed of sound is about 300 to 400 meters per second. 340, more specifically. So you had a really big range here. You need to make sure you included a unit, okay? Because if you put kilometers per hour or kilometers per second, obviously it wouldn't be right. Density of room of air at room temperature and pressure. This one was the one that was really hard here. Just knowing this one's quite a, a bit of knowledge. You just had to go away um, from the estimation uh, topic and have a look at the ones you were asked to learn during that topic. And density of air is one kilogram per meter cubed. Again, you need the units. Just thinking of how you might estimate this, think about water, okay, is a thousand uh, kilograms per meter cubed, okay, so you know it's going to be a lot lighter than that, okay, so do bear that in mind when you're thinking of these. Mass of a protractor, okay, hopefully you had a protractor with you in the exam, just thinking it's probably between 10 and 20 grams, okay, the range they gave was 5 to 50. Volume of a head of an adult person. Um, you might have done this actually in class. Maybe you did surface area in class when we looked at estimating the number of hairs on someone's head. Okay, you're just going to do probably um, this one probably needs a bit of maths compared to the other. Maybe a assuming it's like a, a sphere, you might do uh, four thirds pi r cubed. Okay, well pi is about three, so we might say four times r cubed. And we might say, well, um, radius of someone's head might be um, maybe, let's say, uh, 10 uh, centimetres. Okay, just a rough estimate. So I'm going to get 10 cubed, which is 1,000. 4 times 1,000 is 4,000 centimetres cubed, which fits right into the range they gave there. Okay, some people were a little bit small. I think underestimating the radius of a head. Um, I don't think anyone was, was too large on that one. Okay, really nice and simple question. A um, bit of recall, a little bit of um, common sense. Okay, question seven. To find the talk of a couple. Uh, a surprising number of students got this wrong, given that it's a definition. Um, so just be really, really careful and make sure that you are looking at your definitions regularly. There was an M mark and an A mark in this question. Uh, so if you don't get the M mark, even if you've written the A mark, you can't get the mark for it. So that's why often people got zero rather than one. Uh, now, the talk of a couple, so a couple being two forces uh, that act in opposite directions to each other but parallel. Uh, you know that for a talk, the... Oh, that's very thick writing, sorry. The product of one of the forces uh, in the couple and the perpendicular distance between the forces. Now, uh, let me grab a different colour pen. The perpendicular bit was the A mark. And so if you say the product of uh, one of the forces and the distance between the forces, that was M1, that would have got you one. But if you didn't say perpendicular, you would not have got the second mark. So that's just one to know. Okay, moving on to part B. A torque wrench is a type of spanner for tightening a nut and a bolt to a particular torque, as illustrated in figure 3.1. So importantly we can see that our pivot is point C before we even look at the rest of the question. I would immediately before I start reading anything else be converting that to meters and I can see an angle that the force is acting in so I would resolve those into vertical and horizontal planes and I know here that I have F sine theta and I know here I have F 
because theta. So before I look at anything else and get distracted, I add what I know because that's important to not go wrong. Uh, okay, I also know that this 0.45 meters is x, it is the perpendicular distance from the pivot and the line of action of the vertical force. And that's the only distance I know. So therefore, I also know that this is the force that I'm going to be interested in in the question. Uh, because it has to be that the force and the perpendicular distance are obviously at right angles to each other. So, let's scroll, sorry, it's over two pages. Uh, the wrench is put on uh, the nut and a force is applied to the handle. A scale indicates the torque applied. The wheel nuts on a particular car must be tightened to a torque of 130 newton metres. This is achieved by applying a force F to the wrench at a distance of 45 centimetres uh, from its centre of rotation C. So it may be applied at any angle theta. So the key here is that it says for the minimum value of F to achieve this torque, so that one is 130 newton metres, um, state the, ang uh, the magnitude of the angle theta that should be used. So, we know that for a torque, we have F sine theta multiplied by X because it has to be F sine theta and not F because it needs to be at right angles to X and X is the value that we've got. Uh, so, the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance is the moment and that, uh, the torque, sorry, and that should be 130 newton metres. Now we know that x is fixed, it's 0.45 metres, so we can say that this one here is 0.45 metres. So this one and this one are both fixed. We want f to be the minimum value possible for these two fixed values, so therefore sine theta needs to be a maximum. Okay. Now, if you think about the fact that it's a sine theta, we know that its maximum has a possible value of 1, and that occurs at an angle of 90 degrees. So sine theta um, equals 1 if theta equals 90. That's the maximum that that can be, which will mean that if this is 1, f is the smallest it can possibly be. So therefore, it has to be at 90 degrees. Then it also says for that same minimum value of F, uh, to achieve that torque, you need to be able to calculate the magnitude of F. So given that we know that that's going to occur at 90 degrees, and we know that the torque is F sine theta X, we know that that's F sine 90 X, um, which then gives us uh, F X, because sine 90 is one. So then I can say, okay, well, the torque is 130. That's what we require it to be. And we know that X is fixed. So that's F multiplied by 0.45. That gets me one mark. Uh, so therefore, F is 130 over 0.45. And that's 288.88 something, something, something. I can't remember. I did this on the calculator earlier. In Newtons. Uh, the question is in two significant figures, so I'm going to write that to two significant figures, and that gives me 290, and that's my second mark there. Okay, for year 12 structured question 8, we've got a spring having spring constant K hangs vertically from a fixed point. A load of weight L when hung from the spring causing the extension E. The elastic limit of the spring is not exceeded. So, state what is meant by an elastic deformation. So there's two parts of this that we need to make sure we've got in our definition. The first bit is the definite deformation part. So when a force acts on an object, it causes a change in shape. Now the elastic part of this um, means that when the force is removed it will return back to its original shape as opposed to plastic deformation 
where it will not return to its original shape. So to make sure we've got this elastic part for the two marks, we need to talk about when the force is removed. So when the force is removed, it returns to original shape. Okay. Um, and then we've got to state the relationship between K, L and E. So K is the spring constant and that is, or that tells us the ratio between the force, which is in this case the load, so it's L, and it tells us how much force is required for each unit of extension. So K equals L over E. You can of course write this as um, L equals E K um, or obviously you could write it as E equals L over K. Either of those is fine. I actually prefer this one um, as I like to think about it as the force required for each amount of extension. Okay, for 8 part B we've got some identical springs each with spring constant K that are arranged as shown in figure 4.1. So lots of people got this wrong because what they were trying to do was trying to work out the K equivalent formula and so doing the 1 over K EQ equals 1 over K1 plus and so on and so on and so on. Um, it's actually easier to just think about the ratios in this case um, in terms of the extensions and so then the force required to get to that extension or the spring constant required because the force for all of them is going to be constant. So from the previous question, we know, or so previous answer, we know that K equals L over E. Okay. So in this case, um, if we're looking for the total extension, force is going to be constant. Um, and so K is proportional to 1 over E. So if we double E, then what we're going to do is we're going to end up with a half K. Okay, so this proportionality is going to be our key to doing this really quickly uh, and quite simply. So in this case we've got a load which is applied to um, springs which are in series so we can think of this all of this load acting on this one spring which is going to cause it to extend by E. Now that load is then directly transferred to the spring above which is also going to cause it to extend by E. So our total extension in this case is going to be 2E. So now our total extension, if our total extension is now 2E, then that is going to give us a K of a half of the original value. So it's going to be K over two or half K. So what that means is to get to the same extension, if we rearrange this, so let's say we're looking at E equals, uh, what is it, E equals L over K. So if our extension has doubled, then for a constant load, K must become 2, sorry, k must become, not 2k, but k over 2, okay, um, because then if we flip that we're going to end up with 2l over k, which is correct, it's going to give us the 2 of the original extension. Let's have a look at the next one. So here we've got a load that's shared now across two springs, so the force we can think of as being L over 2, so the load over 2. Now, if L is over 2, then or half the, the force, then we're going to get half the extension. So we're going to get half E here. And that's going to be applied to both of them. So the distance that it moves down is going to be a half of the value um, it would if it was just one spring and one load. So in this case, the extension is going to be 1 over 2e. 
Now, to get the same extension, to get the same extension as before, going back to our formula, L over K, to get the same extension, oh, here we go, K equals L over E, so per same amount of extension, we need to have now double the force to have the same K, because the K isn't changing for the springs, but the K equivalent would have to be double um, to get the same extension for the same load. So that's going to be equal to 2K. Now for the next part, um, we're going to have the load is shared on these, so we're going to get a half E on this top half and it's all applied to this one spring here so we're going to get E on the bottom section. Now to get the total extension we just add up the extension of each section so we get 1 over 2 E plus E which is equal to 3 over 2 E. So our total extension is 3 over 2 E and we know that from here that K is proportional so 1 over E, so if E is 3 over 2, then K is 2 over 3 of the original K. You can use those formulas, these formulas here, but a lot of people make the mistake of mixing them up um, and getting confused about the extensions. Try and think about the extension of each individual section, add up the extension, to find a total extension and then use this relationship here we knowing that K is proportional to 1 over E um, to find the K equivalent. Question 12. So part A is really straightforward. There were actually quite a number of students that got this wrong uh, which is a bit of a shame. Obviously de uh, density should be defined as mass per unit volume. Okay, The idea of the ratio there is important. Uh, obviously, that's just a straightforward recall question. So liquid of density rho fills a container to a depth h, as illustrated in figure 3.1. Before I even read the rest of the question, I can see that I know that the volume is going to be equal to ah. That's information that might be helpful to me. Uh, and I also know the density equation is mass over volume. So I'd automatically be writing that uh, in case it helps me out later. Now, the... Uh, container has vertical sides in the base of area A. Not helpful now, we already know that. State in terms of A, H and Rho, the mass of the liquid in a container. So I'm going to rearrange and say that mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. Um, I've already said that volume is equal to A, H, so I can say Rho, A, H. And it's as straightforward as saying M is equal to Rho, A, H in this section. That was done pretty well by everybody. Oh, that's moved, sorry. Not sure what's happened there. Let's get rid of that. Uh, there's an A, there's an H. Okay, hence derive an expression for the pressure P exerted by the liquid on the base of the container. Uh, explain your working. Hence is the important word here because it means following on from what you've already done. So look at what you've already done and therefore derive an expression so you know that you're going to need to use this part of the question to help you out here. So we know that by definition pressure is force over area. Uh, we know that it's going to be the weight of the liquid that acts as the force on the base so it's mg over a and from the previous part of the question we've said that m is equal to rho a h that's then multiplied by G over A. And hopefully you can see that my A's cancel. Uh, and I end up with rho HG. That's worth two marks. Uh, so just some sentence underneath that explains what you're doing as you go would be helpful. Um, but the marking points really come from making sure that you've explicitly referenced your definition of pressure. Okay, let me just scroll down to the last part of the question. Uh, it was done reasonably well, actually. 
Uh, so the dense, they give you the density of the liquid water value and they also give you the density of water vapour. Um, and then they ask you to determine the ratio of the volume um, of the water vapour and the volume of equal mass of liquid water. So I'm just going to refer to that as V1 and this one as V2. Okay, I know density is mass over volume. So volume is mass over density. Now, because it tells me in the question that I have an equal mass of water vapour and liquid water, I can effectively ignore the mass and look at a proportionality statement and say V is proportional to 1 over rho. So if that's the case, if I'm looking at the ratio of V1 over V2 and V is proportional to 1 over rho, I can say that that will be equal to 1 over rho 1 over 1 over rho 2. Okay, and that's obviously equal to rho 2 over rho 1, uh, just using maths. Um, and then it tells you in the question the density values, sorry, overlapping each other there. So uh, rho 2 is going to be of the liquid water, so that's 1. And row 1 is of the water vapour, and that's 1 over 1,600. Now, hopefully, you can see that that's equal to 1,600, and that's my answer. <laughs>